the thing with crypto now, it's so big, we are seeing diminishing returns on things like Bitcoin. Like there's gonna be some new altcoin that goes up 10,000% and you're not gonna be in it and you're gonna be pissed. And some guy's gonna put in a thousand bucks and he's gonna make millions, you're gonna be pissed. But for Bitcoin itself, like let's say in a really ideal scenario, it goes to 150,000, like that'd be phenomenal. Welcome everyone to the Words of Wisdom podcast. We're back once again. Now we're in Toronto and we are joined by none other than an incredible guest. He has been courtside for the Lakers. He has got many watches. He has absolutely crushed the crypto space. And he was originally a Forex trader too. And I think he still dabbles in there. And we're going to go straight into this. We are joined by the one and only Trader Main. It's great to be here with you, man. Great to be here, man. Thanks for having me. It's going to be fun. No, yeah, it's my pleasure. And thank you for traveling over. I know uh, I tried to get as close to you as possible. So Toronto was the closest I could get. You did a good job. Canada's a big country. Yeah. Yeah, we were just talking before. Like the same, it's essentially the same flight back home for the UK to me as it is for you to get home. It, it's nuts. The more I think about it, I feel like the East Coast is just so much more accessible. Mm -hmm. You're closer to Florida, you're closer to Europe and stuff. But. You know, if you ever come out west, I'll show you a good time. We got mountains, nice yeah. nature. It's just a bit of a different vibe, a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. That's what we like. That's what yeah. we need, especially as traders, oh no doubt. Oh my gosh, yeah. But um, I just listed off those things as an introduction, and they're absolutely incredible. You know, crazy accolades. And the first question, really, I want to ask you is how did you get to that stage? Because everyone always focuses on that stage, right? All those accolades, they focus there. But how did you get there? Yeah, I always. Um I always tell people what you see on social media is it's like the tip of the iceberg, right? Mm -hmm. You've seen that meme on the internet where it shows you just the tip of the icebergs above the water and you don't see all the stuff going on under the surface. And that's, that's trading, that's business, that's mm -hmm. life. Um, social media is the highlight reel. You know, I'm not courtside at the Lakers every day. Uh, I'm not wearing a Rolex every day. A lot of days I'm in my office, mm -hmm. the blinds are closed and you know, I'm there 14 hours. I'm on calls, I'm in the charts. Um, so it's, it's a process. Um, and, uh, I've been doing it a long time. I mean, I got on Twitter in 2014, mm -hmm. so that's coming up on a decade, wow. uh, which is crazy, um, to think about. Um, but, uh, I think it's a combination of, you know, hard work and there's a, there's a bit of luck involved for sure. I think with crypto specifically, um, the way the market moves, just timing things and, and getting involved at the right time and, and early. Uh, I tell people this all the time, like, what did you make the most money on? I was like, just buying early and holding it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's really hard to out trade something that can go up 20 X in 12 months. Um, but, uh, it's been a, it's been a labor. It's a lot of, uh, tuition paid in the form of, you know, lost sleep, lost money, um, you got to sacrifice relationships and time with friends and doing fun stuff. But, you know, now that we're kind of on the other side of it, you know, the progress continues, uh, you know, it feels good. It's a very rewarding career and it's not one I ever thought growing up that, you know, this is what I was going to do or be able to achieve, but it's been awesome. This is quite the journey, yeah. quite the journey. And I believe you started in FX though, right? Yeah. So I started in crypto actually originally, okay. but I lost all my money. So 2013, 14, Bitcoin went from like a hundred dollars to 1400. And I was lucky enough to buy, you know, at a couple hundred bucks, a lot of Bitcoin and it went to 1400 and I'm 23, 24. And I made enough money that for a 23, 24 year old, you think you have like infinite money. Like when going out with your friends is buying six beers and going to the bar and getting, you know, cheap drinks, uh, having, $150,000 is I, I quit my job. I moved out of my house. Mm -hmm. I told my parents, I'm like, I'm a day trader now. I don't know about you guys. I'm not going to school anymore. Forget my accounting degree. Um, and then the market basically crashed completely. I, hadn't, I learned very quickly. I had no idea what I was doing. I just got lucky, right? I wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't a good trader. I was just a bull in a bull market basically. Mm -hmm. Um, so when the market crashed, I that's kind of what spurred me to be like, how does this work? Like, there's got to be a rhyme to the reason because some people made money and kept it. How come I couldn't do that? How come I didn't know you could sell or short or take profit? I didn't know any of that. Um, so that kind of started me on my FX journey. So 2014, 15 started, you know, getting in. Back then it was more forums and stuff than it was Twitter and, um, you know, YouTube and that kind of space was still very new. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, found ICT, found guys like Tom Dante and these price action guys. And I started to you know put the pieces together and 
trade forex i got into you know ftmo early days and was trading prop back then and uh when crypto kind of got exciting again in 2016 17 i saw things that i was doing in fx i'm like oh this works here too mm -hmm. and that was kind of the beginning of it really it's incredible and when you look at sort of the cryptocurrency space and sort of the ICT, you don't really, well, I don't see it as much, personally. I don't see as much like cryptocurrency traders using ICT. But then when you look at the FX space, it's completely like rife and there's so much like cult-like mentality. Do you see the same or is, is there a lot of ICT concepts being used in crypto as well? So you know what, it's so funny because I, you can go find me putting order blocks on Bitcoin charts in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to get a lot of hate for it. Because mm -hmm. similar to how there are ICT cultists mm -hmm. now, there's also a faction of people in FX Twitter who thinks I ICT is a, a LARP or a scammer, or yeah. a furu, whatever you want to call it. Um, and my argument always was very simple because at least in crypto, people thought initially that technical analysis didn't work at all. Mm -hmm. Not just ICT, but they're like, this is, you know, the Wild West. It's fundamentally driven. It's, mm -hmm. you know, all these things. I said, look, I, I, I do this and it works. Whether or not you think the guy who taught it to me is legit or not, I use it. Mm -hmm. I make money. That's all the proof I need. Um, so I got I actually got a lot of hate, funnily enough, early on for it. I interviewed ICT back in like 2016 or 17. Wow. Yeah, on my YouTube. It's like my most viewed video still to this day. Because um, he saw me doing it in crypto and he's mm -hmm. like, this stuff will work. It's got a chart. This stuff will work. Um, and it's funny now you can go on crypto Twitter and whether or not they want to admit it, they're marking order blocks, they're marking fair value gaps, they're using liquidity sweeps and whether or not you think ICT invented it, he can actually trade. I always said, I, I don't care. Try it yourself. It's the best proof, right? Mm -hmm. Like try it yourself. If it works for you, maybe it's not as bad as you think. Maybe mm -hmm. he repackaged stuff that already exists, but, um, they're definitely using it. There's not the level of um god complex that some people like you know they're naming their twitter account after him and their mm -hmm. firstborn son is named michael um but there's definitely there's definitely concepts are being used and i think as crypto's matured it's starting to trade more like fx anyways and mm -hmm. i tell you know i tell our friends right our fx guys i'm like you got to try crypto out because when it's moving like it is now it's the best market in the world definitely and what was that transition like though obviously you know going from making that big money and then did you lose the money or did you lost it? Lost everything I put in and more because I kept buying on the way down, wow. thinking it was going to go back up. And mm -hmm. turns out that's not how it works. <laughs> so <laughs> went back to work and mm -hmm. yeah, it was. How did you overcome that though? Because that's, that's a journey that many people go through. The scale of it is obviously different to the person of how much they lose, et cetera. But sure. so many people go through that where they make a big win. They have that beginner's luck, for example. Uh, they see the reality of what trading can do. And then they're faced with losses. And most people don't overcome that. But you did. So how did you go that about that? Well, it's like running, right? You know, you hit that runner's wall mm -hmm. where you start your run and you're getting into it a little bit. And you're like, oh, my legs hurt now. My feet hurt. And mm -hmm. once you kind of get past that wall, then all of a sudden you're going for another five miles. Mm -hmm. um, it's very similar. And when people say trading's hard, I, I don't think learning how to draw lines and boxes on a chart is hard. I think it's overcoming these mental and psychological barriers mm -hmm. is the hard part um, and pushing through them and that's why I think 90-95% of people fail is they don't get past that they don't have the ability to push past that mm -hmm. rejection I think part of what was lucky for me um, I worked in sales so rejection is part of life um, I had a great sales mentor at a company I worked at who's like if you're taking 10 calls and three people you know do well that's 30 percent. it's like well guess what a baseball player who hits 300 three out of 10 is an all-star like that's a good thing right mm -hmm. so it was kind of like framing it as like okay like the fact that i was able to make this money it showed me what was possible so i framed it as not like oh man i had all this money and i lost it it's like wow this is what's possible mm -hmm. with just this much effort what if i you know refine my craft what if i get better and um, I think that's huge. Uh, you have to be your own biggest cheerleader um, because it's you against your p &L. It's you against you. As much as social media thinks it makes it seem like it's like, well, how much did this guy make in payouts? What kind of car does he have? This guy's got a nicer watch than me. None of that really matters at the end of the day. So it's about framing, uh, I think, the mindset. And I was lucky enough, whether it be 
something that I was consciously doing or unconsciously doing to kind of frame it as I saw it as an opportunity as opposed to like a roadblock. No, I love that. And I think that that self-talk is so important. And as you said, like maybe you weren't consciously doing it, but even if you weren't, I think it's a powerful thing that people need to take on board. Do you feel like, I know the journey, was it two to three years to getting profitable after that point? About that. I mean, I, I would say two years till I knew what I was looking for when I opened up a chart uh, and then closer to three years before I was like consistently making more than I was losing. Okay. And what did those two to three years look like there? So I think initially, right, you have over analysis. I was low time frame. I'm trying to scalp, you know, because you see guys like ICT, they're on the one minute chart. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, lower time frame, more trades, more money. Usually that's not the case. What I've actually found is the complete opposite. The better I got at trading, the less trades I took. Um, so once I kind of got away from the low time frame, I saw a leap in my improvement. I was like, okay, I'm more focused on like, where's the next daily candle going or where's the weekly trend? And then trying to get involved with that kind mm -hmm. of early in the week and ride it throughout the week. Um, and then getting close to profitability, I think was, you know, break even trading for a while. Oftentimes it was being like perfectly wrong, like entering a trade, think I'm in the right position, then closing it because it goes in, you know, a couple pip drawdown and then it does exactly what I okay. wanted to do. Um, and then the profitability stage is, I think, one of the most fulfilling parts because early on, it's I was voracious about the learning and getting mm -hmm. into the content. And then you kind of have a period where you feel like you're spinning your tires a little bit. You're not really seeing that improvement. You're losing money or maybe you're just kind of keeping afloat. But then when you start to actually get into charts and you're like, okay, I know exactly what I'm looking for today. And if it's not there, mm -hmm. I'm done. I'm, you know, I'm looking at something else or I'm moving on. Uh, that got exciting again. I think that kind of re-motivated me. Um, and then it's just about consistency. Like one of the biggest things ICT taught me, it's not the TA as much as it's, it's a numbers game. Like you can break everything in trading down to numbers and stats. Um, and uh, that was very eye-opening for me. Mm -hmm. Like realizing it's like, okay, I only need to be right 33% of the time if I'm aiming for 2R. I can do that. Um, and you know, how many trades is that a week and, 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 and building out that system that is repeatable. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing that back testing, that forward testing, the data I have is actually worthwhile. And I'm a numbers guy, finance accounting background. Um, so that was really, I think what took me to the next level was making my strategy mechanical, repeatable. Um, and so numbers and statistics driven that I removed as much human element as possible there's always discretion there's always trading psychology and things but the less of that you can have the better off you're going to be would you say that there's no such thing as like a perfect trader like someone who only follows the system because there's always going to be that discretion and we're human at the end of the day so emotions will get involved at times but your job is really to focus on the system if you follow the system for the majority of the time you're going to have that profitability yeah i mean i think if your goal was to follow your rules as opposed to make money, you would probably be better off. Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, did I follow my system to T? The money is a byproduct of the work, right? That's the whole point of doing all that testing and collecting all that data is you know over the large enough sample size, you're gonna have that profitability because you have the data. But if you go into it saying, you know, I wanna make a million dollars this year, um, that's a really big number. How do you get there, mm -hmm. right? And so I like to start, you can start with that big goal, but now work it back. You know, okay, how much is that a month? Okay, how much is that a week? How many trades is that a week? You know, what trades, you know, what win rate and all that stuff. So I think following the process absolutely is should be the focus. But listen, I mean, I've been doing this for literally 10 years. Uh, I still have FOMO. I still rage revenge trade sometimes. I take dumb positions. I open up my phone and, so, you know, I miss the entry and I'm chasing. I mean, it, it is what it is. And that's what's so fun about trading is it, you're never going to be perfect. You mm -hmm. can always refine, improve, tweak. Um, and you're, yeah, we're human at the end of the day. I make mistakes. I take mm -hmm. dumb trades. Like, I don't think people should be discouraged. Like, going back to the social media thing, that's the highlight reel. When they're showing you the payouts, they're not showing you how many challenges they bought mm -hmm. to get that payout. Or they're showing you the six-figure P&L. They're not showing you the five trades before that that were all losers. Um, so you can't let that. Uh, kind of seep into your consciousness and be like, oh, I'm I'm not winning every trade. It's like, no one is. Best traders I know are, you know, they're hitting 
40 to 50 percent of their trades if that some less so uh yeah no such thing as a perfect trader uh, i mean we're imperfect uh beings right mm -hmm. no definitely no definitely and i love what you said there in terms of the social media being like the highlight reel for sure but how do you handle that because a lot of people i think a lot of people have a misconception of trading and then that probably is one of those mental hurdles that they really have to get over is i need to be a perfect trader you know i'm going to become at a certain time if i learn for long enough or i learn this certain strategy i'll be a perfect trader i won't experience fomo or greed or or you know uh, trying to jump into a trade but as you've highlighted and i think it's the reality for all traders that those moments will and can and will always happen but how do you handle them now so you, it doesn't so a small mistake doesn't become like a big mistake which is probably what a lot of people are in right now take your trading to the next level with funded peaks we offer the biggest drawdown in the entire industry at 12 percent with the max account size of six hundred thousand dollars and 24-hour payouts funded peaks is the prop you should have started with Learn from the best, build a track record, and become a real fund manager with optimum trading conditions and 24-7 support. Funded Peaks has the best pricing offers in the industry with challenges from as low as just $50. Join Funded Peaks and get started today. Um, <clears throat> repetition, right? Um, when you feel things like FOMO or emotional swings, those are the hardest to deal with when you haven't experienced them before. When you've been in a trade that is in the red for three days and then goes to your take profit and you know what that feels like, you can identify that emotion. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Like it's there, right? You're like, oh man, like I, maybe I should close. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm checking my, ugh, maybe I should close. But the amount of times I've been in the red, closed, and then seen it go into the, you know, the green the next day or, you know, that same day, um, I've been through that swing so many times. I can identify that emotion. I can try my best to not act on it. Um, trading is so much like sports, right? Like you are in the gym, you're taking your free throws, you do 10,000 free throws, you know you're going to hit 80% of them. So when it's game time, it, like it's just automatic, right? You know exactly what you're doing. Of course, yeah, the crowd is there, it's louder. Maybe you missed the first one, maybe the game is close, but you've put yourself in the position so many times that you can manage it better, but you're never going to be able to, we're not robots. Like you're never going to be able to eliminate that completely, but the more you experience it, the better you're going to be able to identify and hopefully manage those things. So it's like getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, absolutely. Like I, there's so many analogies for like trading and sports or other forms of gambling or, um, anything that requires mastery right mm -hmm. like there's that malcolm gladwell book where it's like ten thousand hours it's like i think most of us traders can say it's like one way or another i've put in ten thousand hours mm -hmm. whether it's in trades in front of the charts managing positions um you know back testing forward testing uh and it's just it's just so accurate you just you need the repetitions and that's why when you're new if you're winning you don't necessarily know how to handle it and if you're losing you don't necessarily know how to handle it like you know my systems some of the systems i trade i can take four five six losses in a row mm. and you got to trust that you know it's going to balance out you know over the next 50 trades whereas if you take four five six losses in a row and then you change what you're doing all of a sudden all that data you've collected goes out the window right it's not a system anymore mm -hmm. No, definitely. And that's probably where most people find themselves, especially in that learning phase. One thing you mentioned earlier, which I think relates to exactly what you're saying, is you went through a, a period of time where, you know, you'd be in good trades, but you'd get out of them when they're going to draw down. Um, was it the same principle there, though? Just repetition? Yeah, I think one of the best pieces of, of advice I give to like a new trader is when you enter a trade, put on your stop loss and your take profit and do not touch that trade until it hits one of those two orders. Mm. Because the amount of money that I've missed out on or lost by closing early before it hits my stop or not taking profit saying, well, it's going to go a little higher. I'm like, ah, I think this might go for 4R, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it ride. Uh, and then it fully reverts, right? Or it comes close to my stop loss, doesn't stop me out, then it goes in to take profit. Mm -hmm. That outweighs the money I would have saved by closing that trade early or letting it run that extra few points. I think trade management in terms of, you know, uh, dynamic risk reward. So adjusting your stop to break even or taking half the position off at 2R or all that kind of stuff, I think should be done later. Uh, okay. Focus on simplicity first. Say, okay, mm -hmm. if my system is built for 2R, 
I'm either getting stopped out or I'm getting too hard. Uh, and that's going to, it's like a mechanical way to kind of try and remove those, you know, emotional components because mm-hmm. everyone's been there where it hits your take profit, but you're not looking at the chart anymore. You're looking at the P and L number and you go, well, this, what if this gets a little bigger, that'd be pretty sweet. Or you're looking at the red number and you go, I don't want it. it it's so, it's like the casino. There's a reason the slots are bright and they make noises when you're mm-hmm. winning and it's, it, it plays with you. So Tom Dante actually taught me something in one of his webinars where he's like, once I enter the trade, I take the P and L screen away. Like I'm not looking at, you know, MetaTrade or whatever you're using. I'm just looking at the chart because it helps him at least mentally not look at that number. Mm-hmm. Crypto is so bad for that because like they, you know, are flashing this big green number, this big red number in front of you. And that's all you can focus on. We got, you know, we're sophisticated monkeys. Monkey brain sees green number. I'm like, oh, that's good. <laughs> I want a bigger green number, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's a, a good way to help it. Put those orders on and mm-hmm. then let it hit one or the other. Definitely. And you think then obviously through experience and collecting data over time through that process, that's when you learn how to start doing dynamic risk later. Sure, because there's that level of subjectivity that comes in where you say, I've seen this before. Mm-hmm. Right? You've done it so many times. Like I've seen this before. They're they're faking me out. Like my stop, because my stop's where the idea is wrong. So if we're not at my stop, why am I closing? Mm-hmm. Right? That's what you gotta kinda gotta ask yourself. And if you're closing because most the most common one is, well, I don't want to lose this much money. It's like, well, are you risking too much then right off the get go? So there, there's so many little things, and that was something that was huge for me. Is was like, okay, I'm I'm either making money or I'm losing money, and that money I'm putting up to lose, I'm prepared to lose it. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's a thousand dollars, maybe it's a hundred dollars, who knows? But you're ready to lose it, and again, it's trying to remove that emotion as much as possible. Definitely, definitely. And going back to what you said earlier in terms of you know making those losses and then going back to work and going back to the drawing board to learn how did you go through that in terms of uh, mentally because being at that age as well it's quite easy to have that ego or to have that sort of thought process of like no i'm not i'm never going to work a job again and as you said like you told your parents a certain thing as well and a lot of people in those scenarios either they'll have too much ego and, and say like i'm not made to work a job and there's a lot of people who haven't even made money who have that mentality nowadays which is shocking to me but um but then also they might have this sort of uh, pressure in their mind of like oh, i've told everyone this and that and now it's not happening how did you overcome all of that uh there's a level of bravado being 25 <laughs> for sure right like i'm 25 like i can i can make it happen again um you know i think the common misconception with trading is like i'm gonna be trading with my cell phone or laptop at the beach and i don't have a boss i do it the market is the boss you got a boss. It's you. It's the market. It's your system. It's the hours that the market operates. Um, you know, you are your own risk manager, your own boss. Um, and it's not the sexy, laid back, chill thing that you necessarily see online. And then something you can attest to as well is usually when you get into trading and you start having success, you really become an entrepreneur um, because you want to have other streams of income. You don't want to only rely on trading. So you start taking that money, you put it other places. So you're creating work for yourself. Mm. So I I think that there's such a big misconception. Again, it's sold by social media that you're going to be driving a Ferrari and you're going to be trading from your cell phone. And it's like the amount of times I've taken a trade from my cell phone at the beach and it worked out. (laughs) Not very many. Usually I'm locked in. I'm, you know, I have a process. I'm, I've gone to the gym. I've had my meal. I've, you know, sat and marked up all my charts Mm -hmm. and then I'm executing. Um, But at 25, um, listen, I moved back home. I moved, you know, I went from living on my own to living in my dad's basement. Um, It was definitely uh, a bit of an eye-opening experience and, you know, kind of like, okay, like I got to, you know, maybe I'm not all that I thought I was. Mm -hmm. I've never read really any trading books and I don't really like reading, you know, a lot of people are always reading these like self-help books and things like that. And I've never really resonated with those, never found them interesting except there's a few around the law of attraction that I really enjoyed by like Eckhart Tolle and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's about, and it sounds so corny, but manifestation and all this stuff. And I find most of these business books, it's the same thing. They're just repackaging it and telling you it's setting goals, Mm -hmm. right? If you set goals, you make them attainable, you lay out how you're going to get there. You focus on them, you're journaling, like you'll get there. And whether you think that's through pure manifestation, or maybe it's because I wrote it down and then I worked every day towards it. And now I'm there. Um, that's what kind of happened for me. I got really good at journaling. I've journaled basically daily since I was in my mid twenties, writing down everything from fitness goals, relationship goals, trading, 
life in general. Um, and I think it's just helped me stay grounded and it's also just helped me have direction. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always been a hard worker. And again, I think, I think, I think having that clear path of where I wanted to go and then framing it as a step back as opposed to a knocking me to a completely different path. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was huge. It's how you frame everything. I mean, I've got tattoos about it. Like your perception is your reality. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Like you get to choose how you perceive a situation, how people perceive you. Um, and once you kind of realize that that's within your control, it's very powerful. Um, so I think for a lot of people, it's very easy to get discouraged and stuff, but it, it, it comes down to like, you know, what are you made of? Mm -hmm. You know, are you the type of person who, you know, something doesn't work and you're like, well, good luck. Or you're like, well, it didn't work this time, but you know, I'm going to take another swing at it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I, I love that. And how, how important do you think that same principle is in trading? We talked about it earlier about how you control the narrative in your mind of uh, the self-talk, right? And it's, it really goes back to that same point. And how important do you think that is within an, a trader to have that mentality? I mean, if you go into a trade saying, this is not going to work out, I think this is a bad trade, I'm going to lose money, you probably will, mm -hmm. um, you know, because whether you subconsciously exit it early or do something you shouldn't do, um, mindset is so huge. Um, I think all, and that's why you see so many common traits, I think, between successful traders. Mm. They're disciplined. They work out. You know what I mean? They um, work on self-improvement. They're reading. They're listening to podcasts. They're journaling. I think the reason these traits are so common is because these are things that just, they mesh very well with good trading habits. Mm -hmm right? Going to the gym diligently and having a workout plan and tracking your calories and knowing what you're doing when you're in there and progressive overload, lifting more, a little more every week. That's trading, right? Like it's the same thing, right? Oh, how many R am I going for this week? What do I need to do to get there? Okay. New York sessions coming up. I got to do my prep. Well, going to the gym, you're taking your creatine and your pre-workout and you're having your, you know, pre-workout meal. So I think there's a reason you see so many of these similarities, not just with traders, but with successful people in general. Mm -hmm. um, I had a guy who was an early trading mentor for me. I found him on Twitter, um, but it was a lot more around psych psychology and that type of um, stuff as opposed to actually just charting. Mm -hmm. um, and he taught me something called the rule of the atom. And he's like, the atom is 99% empty space. Mm -hmm. And then in that 1%, that's where all the action is, right? That's everything. That's the entire universe and he says this is applicable to life like you look in so many different ventures whether it's wealth distribution whether it's 90 95 percent of traders don't succeed and the one percent you know have these elite jobs or these elite athletes he's like that's just life um and i think i don't necessarily i think part of it maybe it's just how you're you're built mm -hmm. you're born that way but i do think it can be learned um that you got to have that mentality like i can do anything that I've set my mind to. It sounds so corny, but if, if you don't believe in yourself, like why should anyone else believe in you? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so I think those self-belief, positive self-talk, whether you want to call it goal setting, manifestation, law of attraction, whatever you want to call it, I think it's massively crucial mm -hmm. to success in whatever avenue you take. I mean, I've, I've followed you for a long time. You've got posts from years ago being mm -hmm. like, this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And now you're here now. And sometimes it's very eye opening to go back. Like I have all my old journals yeah. and sometimes I go. So on new year's, I go and read, not just last year, I'll read three years ago yeah. and I'll be like, Oh, I smashed this man. Oh, this one got to make more of a priority. But like, I don't know. I don't know if you were consciously doing mm -hmm. that or that's just, but it worked for me. No, I was the same. I was the exact same. Uh, when I was growing up rather than when I was a teenager, it was really weird. I went through, I went through like that sort of more, if you will, reckless stage and sort of less conscious stage, if you will, like later in life, uh, in my like early 20s, while a lot of people do it in their teenage years. Well, in my teenage years, I was spending time like every morning and every night, I'd be listening to like motivational talk, like Eric Thomas, yeah. uh, Les Brown, all these guys. And um, so it was really strange, but I had that mentality growing up, probably thanks to my mum as well. Like she would really, growing up it wasn't a case of like you can't do that you can't do that so i didn't have really much of a limiting mindset and i always believed in just if you put you can push yourself to anything and i think it's so true like there is an element where it's in your dna in terms of like if you're going to have that grit to be able to go through the suffering but again it's it's chosen as well like if someone decides like okay i want to change and i want to be able to handle more loss and more pain i want to be able to push myself to new limits it's down to a choice, right? It's that perception. It's, it's the, the person deciding they want more out of life. 
Absolutely. And that was my mentality. You know, and that's why I used to write those posts because it was more, I used to, that was my journal, you know, those posts yeah. and my, my Facebook, if you will, at the time, because I didn't have anyone. I, w I was a no one at the time. I didn't have any like following or anything. I was just writing these posts as a journal and in the hope that it might help other people at the time. But, um, you know, as I've grown now, now those same posts are helping people now because I share them now and people are like, well, yeah. you know, they see that, oh wait, he was talking about it seven years ago, 10 years ago, and now he's doing what he said then. And I think that it speaks to the long-term vision so like when you came into trading, what was your vision of like how long it would take you to sort of play out to the profitability? <clears throat> you know, it's funny. I mean, crypto is a little bit different because it's it's kind of like the Wild West, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I know people who are multi, multi-millionaires, even some billionaires who wow. got in early. They, they're, they're not even really traders. They just, they just got in. Um, so when I first got in, like, I won't lie, I wanted to make money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not trying to pretend like, oh, I was going to, you know, be two hour a week and this is what I was going to do. It's like, I, I wanted to make money. Mm -hmm. I saw this as a way to make money and provide myself a life that, you know, I think most, you know, I, I grew up in the 90s, right? I wanted the sweet car. Like, you know what I mean? You want like the beautiful girl. You want to be out on a boat. You want to be doing all this cool stuff. I want the Rolex. Like that was all stuff. I When I was a teenager, I'm like, this stuff is cool, right? You're watching movies, you're watching TV shows. And so when I first got that taste of like, oh, like this is, you know, I, so I got an accounting finance degree. I got my CPA, which is like professional accounting designation. And when I got out of university, my first salary was $33,000 a year. Okay. And I had a senior manager at the firm I was working at who was like, you know, 45 maybe. And he sat me down. He said, listen, like you do this, this, and this, you play your cards, right? Like this could be your job someday. And I'm just like, your job sucks. <laughs> like, I don't want your job. Like you're 45, you make 70 K a year. Like this can't be my, my future. Um, but I grew up in a family, um, where, you know, my brother's a dentist, my other brother's a doctor my other brother is an engineer like you get a career you go to going to uni wasn't an option it's like mm -hmm. you go to uni you get a profession and that is what you do my dad's a dentist my grandfather's a dentist so um i i just remember like being like okay i'm gonna finish this and then i'm gonna tell my parents basically like i'm either like off in myself or i'm like quitting this job as soon as i like finish it because for them i think knowing that i saw it through and i had that to fall back on was enough for them to kind of be like okay if you want to go try this thing you mm -hmm. can always go back to being an accountant if it doesn't work right mm -hmm. um but yeah i wanted to make money like i just i feel like from a young age i always had aspirations of being my own boss and making a bunch of money um in terms of like how that played out in my trading journey i don't think i planned it early on that didn't come until i started actually learning that trading is a business mm -hmm. it's not gambling right crypto especially can make you feel like you're just you're just gambling you're just flipping coins and there is an element of crypto that is that if you're on crypto twitter there are guys who are they're gambling on new projects altcoins they're straight up gambling they're trying to get a lottery ticket mm -hmm. they got 10 grand they put a thousand dollars into 10 coins yeah. right the risk reward is zero or maybe a lot <laughs> yeah. right um but i've always and i think how i grew my following was i approached crypto like a forex trader mm -hmm. i'm systematic this is a job right like i'm here to extract money from the market i don't care what the coin does i don't care if there's a partnership they just announced if they're the next ethereum i don't give a shit pardon my french uh, i'm more just interested in like does the chart look good mm -hmm. and do i think that you know i can risk this much money and potentially make this much and once i started framing trading as a business um, then it just all became about scale. Um, you have to focus on it in terms of risk reward, not in terms of dollars, because as your account scales and grows, um, it can really mess up your mentality when you go from risking a hundred bucks to a thousand bucks to $10,000 on a single position. Can't think like that, right? Cause if I think, oh, I just lost a Honda Civic on that trade you know, what does $10,000 get you? It can get you, you know, two couple months rent. It can feed you for a month. Like you can do a lot of stuff with 10 grand, but it's just one R, right? So once I started treating it as about a business, you know, I focused on, okay, I want my R basically to become a bigger number. Mm -hmm. um, but just remembering that still that one or 2% of the account to kind of keep myself in check and not, you know, let the 
big number get scary because I think that's something people who are trying to start trading larger accounts, mm -hmm. it'll mess them up. They start thinking about the risk in terms of how much money am I losing versus, well, it's just 2%. It's 2% before what has changed, right? Definitely. And, you know, it's so interesting you say that. Obviously, that scalability and, and the scaling of those numbers is something that a lot of people struggle with. Even within the FX side, obviously, we have all the prop firms and a lot of people struggle that way where a lot of people will go for the highest account size when they haven't maybe gotten accustomed to the, that sort of risk and that yeah. sort of R. What advice could you give them in terms of being able to play that longer term vision or getting more comfortable with those higher figures? I want to tell you about the best provider of tools for traders, and that is Lux Algo. Lux Algo is the largest provider of free tools on TradingView. You've probably seen them all over TradingView as well for their smart money concepts indicator, as well as so many other free resources. Now, if you don't know, they have also created exclusive toolkits to take your trading to the next level directly on trading. Whether you trade price action, ICT, or you want advanced signals and powerful overlays, they have all the tools necessary for you to grow. All their tools work on every market. So whether you trade Forex, crypto, or stocks, it does not matter. Now through the podcast, you can get 20% off using the link in the description. So make sure you click that and let's get back to the episode. Um, I mean, if you're trading your own capital and if let's say you're paper trading or something, paper trade with a realistic amount, like the amount of people I see who are paper trading with a million dollar account mm -hmm. and then they're going to fund their account with a thousand dollars. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be eye opening when one pip goes from being, you know, 500 bucks to five dollars. You're going to be like, what's going on? Um, so keep things realistic if you're trading your own account. Um, <clears throat> but you have to take um, the numbers out of it. You got to, or not the numbers out of it, but the money side out of it and realize it's just numbers and it's just math. Um, if you're risking one to 2% of your account, you're aiming for 2R, 33% win rate breaks even, your money compounds, that one to 2% grows. Um, and you just got to trust the, the data that you've either put together yourself or it's just out there. I mean, you can find these incredible journals now that will help you basically find every single piece of statistics that you need to get confidence in your system um, and then go slow <clears throat> I think a huge mistake is people try and jump into this really fast I did right I quit my job immediately you do not need to trade full-time I think trading full-time is actually not realistic for most people because you have to be really good um, really consistent and you have to have enough money for it to be worthwhile because you can know what you're doing but if you're trading a ten thousand dollar account guess what that's not enough to live here or in london or vancouver or new york um, so uh, i think take your time and realize that it's a process and a skill if you're willing to spend four years at uni and spend you know a hundred thousand dollars on a degree don't expect to become profitable and make enough money to trade full time in six months I think another thing with social media that's so disingenuous is you see people, you know, they're like, I, I was profitable in six months. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, but like on a thousand dollar account or a $10,000 account, being profitable with a 10K account and a million dollar account where you're literally paying for your lifestyle with your trading are very different things. Uh, and I think prop is great. <clears throat> that's why I started Breakout for the crypto side. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm like, I don't think people in crypto realize the advantage these FX guys have. Like there's a whole industry here of prop traders. Mm -hmm. It's not just like the FX guys anymore who are, you know, trading in the Robins cup and, you know, posting on their fake brokers that they own. And like this prop industry brought a level of, first of all, it's leverage, mm -hmm. but it brought a level of credibility to F FX Twitter because like, well, I mean, you can fake payouts, but people are usually going to find out, but it's 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 a form to create that process that I went through kind of slowly mm -hmm. quicker right because now with 500 bucks you can have a you know 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollar account yeah I, I think that's something that people absolutely should be jumping all over mm -hmm. uh, because the barrier to entry is a lot lower and the risk reward calculation becomes how many of these evaluations challenges do I have to buy to get funded yeah. and then potentially start making some money I think, yeah, the prop space has proliferated like crazy over the last few years. Like some people think it's a bubble. Maybe it's going to burst. Maybe it is. Um, but I think it's a good thing for the trader. Mm -hmm. I think it's a massive, massively good thing for the trader. And it's something that should be taken advantage of because it can help you scale up much faster. Mm -hmm. What's it been like then, obviously, putting that together? What was that process like in terms of how long did it take you to put that together? And, and what was your mindset? I know, obviously, as you just mentioned, 
giving that opportunity to the crypto side because they didn't really have it. And uh, what sort of hurdles or challenges have you faced like bringing that to market? So the first thing that was the most, I mean, we, we've been working on this for about a year. The, the first thing I wanted to tackle was, because you can trade crypto with certain prop firms already, mm -hmm. but it wasn't crypto that a crypto native person would understand because they're going to look they're going to say okay i have bitcoin i have ethereum i have like litecoin which no one cares about i have these coins from you know years ago and the spreads were crazy you know bitcoin the spread might be 20 bucks you're like well it's only 20 dollars i'm like okay try trading in and out of that a bunch of times in a day you're not making any money um and um I knew that if I tried to get someone who came from a crypto background to like use MT4 or something, they're going to be like, what is this? This is from like 1995. And I'd be like, you're right, it is. And they've never updated it. Uh, for an FX person, MT4, MT5, like that's just, just what you use. I mean, I personally, when I use MT4, MT5, I execute on my phone. Mm -hmm. Like I'll do my charting on TradingView, but I'll, I can't, I hate the desktop app. Yeah, same. And these crypto websites and exchanges are very modern. Right. Mm -hmm. They have built in calculators. They're, you know, polished. And I'm like, I'm not going to be able to get someone to translate that to that. So if one thing was the UI. I wanted it to feel familiar because I think that is a huge part of trading. It's kind of like I don't trade as well from my laptop, you know, in a hotel room as I do from my computer with my three monitors because more monitors, more money. Everybody knows that. <laughs> um, and then the other thing was I wanted the experience to replicate a crypto trading environment. Mm -hmm. So we were able to do that by partnering with a tier one exchange. Um, so the spreads that you see, um, the depth of market, so the actual order books, you get to see that in crypto was visible to you. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to enter one Bitcoin or five Bitcoin, you might not get the exact price you see because that might not be available at the highest bid or mm -hmm. the you know highest, lowest offer. Um, if you're entering 10 Bitcoin, yeah, you will get slipped, but it's real. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to be realistic. So what you see on our platform is the same that you see with our partner Bybit one for one. We don't change a thing. Um, and two, I want people to be able to if they can make money with me, I want them to be able to make money in the real market, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the issues with some prop firms is the simulated demo experience, whatever you want to call it, isn't maybe a strategy that works there isn't going to work in a live environment with live fills. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be disappointing for you if you're like, oh, I know what I'm doing. But no, you only work there because, you know, you're playing, you're bowling with the bumpers up mm -hmm. basically because they're saying there's no slippage, no fees, no commission. It's like, well, but there is in real life. So that needs to be accounted for. So I want to make it realistic. And we are able to solve those two problems with the UI and then the liquidity for back, lack of a better term. Um, and then we put it together and we launched. There was definitely an educating of the customer that had to happen. Mm -hmm. You launch a prop firm now on FX Twitter. Everyone's like, great. I know what this is. Yeah. I know what max drawdown is. I know what the daily drawdown is. I know the rules. I know the one step versus two step. And they get that. Mm -hmm. Crypto Twitter um, is full of skeptics. Just FX Twitter is too, but crypto Twitter especially is full of skeptics, partly because we get scammed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been a victim to the biggest scam of uh, basically the last hundred years, like with FTX. Um, so skepticism is, is fine. So there was a level of like having to educate people because they're like, well, I only get a risk 5%. What is that? I'm like, well, if you're actually trading, you shouldn't lose 5% in a day. Mm -hmm. Like that's a bad day. Like you should probably stop and wait for tomorrow and then try again. But they just didn't get it. So there's a level of having to educate them and be like, here, this is a tool. Here's why it's good. Um, and then the hurdles have all been internal because now that we've kind of educated people, we've got people trading, people are making money, they're making payouts. We're saying, okay, the stuff that worked in FX prop might not work here from a risk management perspective for the firm. Coins go up a lot. Mm -hmm. Coins go up for a long period of time. Um, you know, prop is meant for traders. You know, we want to incentivize people to trade, not to invest. This is not a platform where you just come in and you buy something and you log out. Um, you know, I want you to invest. I want you to trade. And that's what we're looking for. I'm looking for traders because ideally in the most... Um, you know, ideal world, you're looking to replicate someone's trade. You're looking to a book mm -hmm. them and someone who's just, you know, going into a trade and entering and not putting a stop and then just hoping it goes up in two weeks. That's not really replicable or um, hedgeable for the firm. Whereas in FX, um, because the market closes on the weekends, yeah, right? Because it rain it's range bound euros not just going to go up forever and even mm -hmm. if it does it's going to retrace first and the markets aren't all 
supremely correlated. Mm -hmm. Like when Bitcoin's going up, basically everything's going up. Yeah. And if Bitcoin nukes, basically everything's going to nuke. So that's been probably the biggest hurdle is trying to say, okay, how can we, um, you know, manage this in a way that makes sense? Mm -hmm. Um, and then educate people on why this is something that you can use. Cause to me, prop is an amazing tool and it's a means to an end. I mean, there's guys like, you know, I, you, you know, Kyle and, and those guys who have a million dollars of prop capital. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's awesome. But I know those guys as well. They're using that money to fund personal accounts. And yep. the end goal is always to get to that personal account stage mm -hmm. where there are no risk rules and it's your own money. You keep all of it. There's the profit split. So it's been a fun journey. Um, you know, and, uh, it's going to be fun to see this thing grow. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like I was talking to you before we kind of went live, like I've given myself a, a job, you know what I mean? And we talked about that earlier too, where it's like, Oh, you're your own boss. It's like I, I found as soon as I started getting successful, I said, how can I diversify yeah. my money? I don't want to just be reliant on this. So you get into real estate, you start businesses and all of a sudden going from no boss to several bosses. It's, it's mm -hmm. an interesting experience. Have you ever seen that clip by uh, Dana White where yes. he says, um, Oh, you want to be your own boss? And he says, yeah, right. And he starts just like saying, you're giving up Christmas, you know, giving up New Year's, giving up all the holidays, you know, for at least a few years, you know, at least. Um, so good luck with that, you know. And I, I really liked it because I, I, he's quite a, a realist in terms of, Love you know, what it takes to, to build an empire like he has, for example, with UFC. Uh, but just generally, that that same principle of like where they took the UFC or where you're going to take a, a breakout prop, for example, or whatever it may be, it's the same principle. No matter how good you are in business in one side or how successful you may be as a trader, any business you start is always going to have that same grassroots mentality and, and time that's necessary and, and the energy that's necessary as well to, to put it in. How have you found that in terms of uh, accepting that though at this stage? like creating this job for yourself. Has it been a bit of a hard a struggle to do that? I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, I was telling you earlier, I live on the West Coast, mm -hmm. um, so I always trade it at nighttime because um, crypto, it's not as, it doesn't follow, you know, kind of the kill zones and as much, mm -hmm. but it, it really, what is the kill zones? When are people awake, right? <laughs> like when is their volatility? So I know mm -hmm. when UK and, you know, Europe and Asia wake up, there's going to be volatility in crypto, just like when it's, you know, kind of New York morning. Um, so for me being on the West Coast, I preferred to trade at nighttime. I was a night owl, I'd sleep in, I'd stay up late. So kind of having to change my mindset a little bit of, you know, I'm still trading, I'm still investing. Um, but now I've I, I've got to be way more laser focused with my time um, because I, I allowed myself a lot of time to chill out, uh, you know, during the day. I got very accustomed to that where, you know, I had my whole process going to the gym and doing all these things to now it's like, okay, well, I'm working more kind of traditional business hours. Um, it's been fun, uh, but yeah, it, it's a grind, man. Like I, sometimes you envy the person who's got the nine five, right? Like five o'clock Friday, like the laptop is closed and you're like, see you Monday, right? Don't, don't call me, don't message me. And it's like, when you run a business, I mean, our prop firms open seven days a week, 24 seven. Yeah, yours. <laughs> there is there is no close right so when the fx guys are like okay yeah you're gonna get some customer service stuff on the weekend but like i got guys who are like we had a guy on christmas who's like he's like in our support and like you know i i put a message in discord i said listen like it's literally christmas we might be a little delayed yeah like i'm in there right like answering questions and and, you know, I got a guy trying to open a position and he's complaining because it won't open it. I'm like, dude, you're trying to open a max, like full portfolio position on a, a random obscure coin on mm -hmm. Christmas. Like, go, go aside. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> go, go do something. Like, give me a break. But mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the battle I've, I've, I've chosen to fight. Um, mm -hmm. But it, I, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we had an amazing first month. Uh, and I think it's going to be up only, as they say in crypto from here. Um and I, I think we're gonna we're gonna see some some waves in the prop space, you know, in this next, you know, now it's twenty twenty four, because when I came into it, one thing I noticed and one thing I wanted to avoid was kind of the race to the bottom that I felt mm -hmm. like was going on, because um, when I paid attention to prop years ago and even as recently as like a year ago, there was time limits. A lot of firms were using equity based drawdown, mm -hmm. and I think it was Angelo TFT who basically said no time limit. And, you know, we're doing static, whatever. And then everyone kind of had to match that or else why mm -hmm. would you trade anywhere mm -hmm. else? These guys got the best rules. And then it kind of just became a, okay, well, how do you iterate more discounts, mm -hmm. slightly more drawdown, slightly lower profit targets? It kind of 
you own a prop firm. What is that? That's just margin going down, 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 yeah. just shrinking. Mm-hmm. So at least on the crypto side, the way we're iterating is we're, you know, I don't consider myself a competitor to, you know, to TFT. Um, we're a crypto prop firm, uh, but it's just a whole different, it's a whole different battle. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's going to be very interesting. I'm interested to see what happens kind of in the main prop space, but I've basically gone from one of the most toxic and crazy places on the internet, mm-hmm. which is crypto Twitter. And I've joined the, what I've learned is the equally as crazy and toxic <laughs> place on the internet. Cause prop Twitter, man, these guys are crazy. Rufus, yeah. Oh, I'm getting like threats over DMS. Cause I didn't give the like I did a giveaway yeah. and it's been an hour since I announced the winner and they haven't received their, I'm like, my friend, you haven't sent me your email. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. I don't know where. And they're like, uh, they're like uh, it, 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 it's, it's something. It's something. Mm-hmm. I thought crypto Twitter is bad. I'm like prop Twitter is right up there, mm-hmm. but it's money, right? Whenever you're dealing with money, like people just get a little nuts. Yeah, no, it's true. And I love what you said there. Like you joined the two, that you've married the two toxic areas of, of yeah, the community. We'll see if it kills me. <laughs> no, no, it should be good. It should be good. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it in terms of, uh, you know, where it's going to go. And, and I think you're someone, by the sounds of it, who enjoys the challenge of, of building something great. Um, and I'm excited to see where that goes for sure. And there's one thing you touched on, actually, during that conversation was in terms of the, the reality of trading live personal funds versus the fantasy that people build in their minds of trading props. Now, I feel like the the simulator, the 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 prop sort of conditions, they're trying their best to emulate live. Some do it better than others. Some do it really poorly. Some try not to do it at all as a selling point. Um, but what can you talk on as someone who's trade propped, as trade you know, personal and large capital in terms of personal as well? Like, why is it important to understand that? Because I think a lot of people don't understand you know, the reality of trading live capital with the slippage and the order book, etc. And I think it's important and that's why I love the podcast. It gives an opportunity to educate people. I think it's important for people to just understand it, regardless of whether they, they end up trading live or not or whether they experience it or not. I think it's important for them to understand what is it that people are referring to and what are the differences. Let's take a break for a minute there, guys, because I want to tell you about the best trading tool on the market, TradeZella. The reason why TradeZella is the number one trading tool that every trader needs is because you can do backtesting, automated journaling, trade replay, in-depth analytics, and so much more. And the greatest part about TradeZella is that it's all automated. All you have to do is connect your MT4 and MT5. It will pull all your data onto the dashboard. You can add playbooks. You can just add notes. You can add images from your trades and you can get the insights that is necessary for you to progress as a trader. Now, TradeZella is for absolutely everyone. Whether you're a crypto trader, whether you're a Forex trader, whether you trade prop firms, it is for absolutely everyone. And that is why thousands of traders have signed up using my link here through the podcast. Make sure you use the code RIZ10 for 10% off your monthly subscription or WOR for 20% off your yearly subscription. The link is in the description below. And let's get back to the episode. Yeah, I mean, there's a cost of trading, Mm -hmm. right? So um, I know people whose entire strategy, especially in crypto, there's there's something called funded, funding, excuse me, that you can get paid for being long or short. Um, And there's certain things that you can almost gamify. So you can hold a position and you're collecting funding. So maybe you're like delta neutral on direction, but you're collecting funding and they can make an entire strategy around gaming these types of systems. And they have a really in-depth knowledge of, you know, what it costs to enter and exit a position with crypto exchanges. If you trade a certain amount of volume, your fees get cheaper. That comes into play if you're trading a large size, if you're using market orders, limit orders. Some people don't pay attention to it as much. They just say this is the cost of doing business, right? Mm-hmm. Like I know I'm going to have to pay $3.50 for every 100,000 units to open and the same thing to close. Um, at least in crypto, you have tier two and tier three data of available to you. So when I'm entering a large position on Bitcoin or an altcoin, especially altcoins, right? Because these are not as liquid as Bitcoin or mm-hmm. Ethereum. Um, which are of course not nearly as liquid as Euro USD or gold or something, but I can see the depth of market. I can see, okay, to fill a hundred Bitcoin, what's the actual price I'm gonna get? So at least there's that visibility. Mm-hmm. Whereas in FX, I can understand, especially if you're new, you say, hey, I entered this trade, and the price was this and my fill is here. Cause you don't get to see that depth. Mm-hmm. But you know, these people who are trading 
50 lot positions on the one minute chart with a five pip stop at a prop firm and maybe it works or they're doing it on demo and then they try it live or they try it at a prop firm that has more realistic conditions they go i got slipped this is a scam i encourage you go and try and do that in the live market like yeah you will get slipped um so the cost of trading um, is a huge thing that you have to factor in mm -hmm. and it will absolutely change the way you trade like a strategy where you are in and out of a ton of trades because you're super low time frame and you're scalping um, that might work in a firm where there are no fees and there's no commissions and you know the environment is a poor replication of a live environment i think it's so important to what you do in practice be as close to what you do in the real environment as possible because um the cost of trading is unavoidable mm -hmm. um it, it 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 is something that i think you need to educate yourself on you need to know what the commissions are um, you need to understand that if you are entering at the market versus a limit order if you're entering with big size um, these things will affect your fills if you're trying to trade around a news event or something like that where liquidity can be quite thin and you'll see those crazy spikes to one side or the other um i think this is something that people are again social media is really bad for this um they see someone they're like they're filled at the top of the wick mm -hmm. i'm like there's a reason they whited out their lot size at the top of the wick there because you're not getting 50 lots on the top of the wick on cpi morning mm -hmm. you know what i mean um and so i think that's something you learn from experience mm -hmm. um but you have to educate yourself about it um and i think if you're going to be trading prop absolutely look for a prop firm that creates a realistic simulated environment um because if they are marketing no fees no slippage we got the like that's a tool to get you in that strategy you're using is probably not going to be replicable in the live environment mm -hmm. so yeah the cost of trading is a real thing it's the cost of doing business like people yeah. who complain about slippage and fees and stuff i'm like you know the broker's got to make some money too right like there's multiple moving pieces here yeah everyone's got to get paid definitely no i think it's so important for people to understand that and, and thank you for highlighting those things uh, something else you mentioned which i think is so important as well is is your routine because you trade as you said you trade london session which for you is late at night and one thing that I find interesting of that, which I think myself, I would probably find hard to do myself, is to be alert and be in the zone at the end of the day, um, which is the sort of opposite of what most people go through with they're doing it at the start of the day. So, so is there any sort of procedures or processes that you do or any sort of uh, techniques to try and just be zoned in at the right time? My best piece of advice, trade the high time frames. Then the kill zones, the sessions matter so much less. Um, and that's something that I definitely gravitated to later in my career. Crypto is kind of an outlier. It can move at 3 p.m. on a Sunday. It can move at 2 in the morning on a Wednesday. So it's kind of hard to time it. There are periods where it's more volatile. Mm -hmm. um, I find West Coast versus East Coast. West Coast is horrible. But when I was primarily trading, so right now we're kind of in, I don't know if we're in a bull run, but we're up a hundred percent, you know, one hundred fifty percent from last year. There's altcoins that are making new all-time highs, so the market's been bullish. So when crypto is volatile like it is now, I trade ninety-five percent crypto. Mm -hmm. um, but when things are a little slower, that's when I'll get more into, you know, back into FX. I love trading gold; it's probably my favorite asset to trade. Um, and for me personally, the strategy that I trade now my setup basically forms at the same time every single day during the week whether it's tuesday or wednesday i'm basically trying to capture the higher low of the week mm -hmm. um it's not going to be tuesday or wednesday every time of course but you know the data suggests and what my you know uh, experience has been is that very often the higher low of the week will form early in the week to monday tuesday wednesday um, so for me, I kind of know when it's game time and during the week, it does require a level of discipline. Mm -hmm. Like, do I want to go have wings and beer with my boys? Uh, you know, of course. And then like I come home and now it's nine o'clock and you got a little bit of a buzz on, like, mm -hmm. am I expected to go sit down at the computer, but it just comes down to discipline. So if I'm actively trading, um, I'm just not like I'm, I'm just not doing anything like it's it's tough but you've got to occupy yourself other ways so I'm going to the gym four or five times a week um, I am 
sitting at my computer prepping the charts so when it is game time right when i am looking to execute a trade i know exactly what i'm looking for mm -hmm. i know where i want to do business i know what time i want to do business at and if it comes it comes if it doesn't it doesn't but it is absolutely harder um to trade at nighttime because you have that entire day basically to mess yourself up um so i mean i used to um i used to smoke a lot of weed back in the day like you know, I thought I was a high functioning stoner basically. Yeah. Cause I'm like, I get good grades. I do all my stuff yeah. and I'm able to smoke pot. Um, for all you pot heads out there, you're lying to yourself. You will be so much more productive and such a better person not being stoned all the time. That was a huge thing for me. Uh, because whether you're actively smoking or not, if you smoke at any point in the day, I don't care what you think. Like you are altered for the rest of the entire day you're burnt out you're tired you're not quite with it so i think having that discipline to be like hey listen it's it's monday tuesday wednesday those were kind of my three work days mm -hmm. and like i said before it's a business right like if you don't have the discipline to not be able to say okay from nine o'clock to eleven o'clock tonight i gotta be at my computer and locked in if you can't do that this is probably not for you mm -hmm. is it easier to do in the morning for some people sure i hate waking up early Right. I got friends who wake up, go to the gym, hit a sauna, cold plunge, and then they're on screen for New York session at like 8 a.m. I'm like, that's that to me is more insane than what I do. <laughs> so, I mean, I think you got to find out. ICT has a really good analogy where he says you need to find out what trading style works for you. Not everyone can be a scalper. Maybe you're a sprinter. Maybe you're a medium distance runner. Maybe you're a marathon runner. And then you got to kind of line up your strategy to fit your personality, your lifestyle, your schedule. Like I said before, you don't need to trade full time. Like I tell people, I'm like, you want to trade and you got a full time job, you got kids, you got stuff on the go. Instead of looking at the hourly and the M5, look at the daily and the hourly. Now you only got to check the chart a couple times a day as opposed to, you know, all day long. Um, so there's so much variability in what you can do and the strategy you set up to fit your your lifestyle. And again, it's a business. So if you can't kind of make those sacrifices and do that type of planning, mm -hmm. you're not really setting yourself up for success. Definitely. No, definitely. I love that. And I think it's so important because a lot of people, they probably force things. And I think it's a good observation that you made in terms of like, I don't, I'm not a morning person, so I'm not going to force myself to do that. And uh, so therefore I'm going to transition to this other um, routine that fits me better. Obviously, I think everything comes with its negatives as well. So like doing the nighttime, as you said, like you would rather obviously be able to go out probably at the end of your day and, and sort of relax. But, you know, as a business, I need to be focused at these times on these days in particular. And uh, as you say, it comes down to the discipline. You know, if you're if you understand that and then you're willing to do it, that's where the results will then come off the back of it. Absolutely. In terms of, uh, you know, you've been trading crypto for a while now. You've been, you know, through many market cycles. Is there any indications um, that you could tell us in terms of like when to look out for certain market moves, like a bull market versus bear market? As you said, like right now we've had a, a lot of bullish movement, but are we in a bull market? So it's one of those things. It's like when you look at the stock market, and I think they say if it's gone down for you know, X percent for mm -hmm. this long, it's a fish, it's technically a recession, but yeah. you look at the stock market now, we're almost back at all time high, yeah. but we're also in the biggest recession of our lifetimes. So it's like kind of confusing. Mm -hmm. um, crypto generally runs in kind of three to four year cycles. Mm -hmm. I found, right. Um, it was created in 2008, 2009. There's a bull run then, then there was another one in 2012, 13. Then there was another one in kind of 2016, 17, and then 2020, 2021. Uh, one of the easiest things to look at is the halving event. So yep. when the mining rewards get halved, so that's coming up this May. Every time that that has happened, crypto usually going into it has been in an uptrend and then proceeds to make an all-time high after. Um, the easiest thing uh, for me, at least, because I got in relatively early, is I'd look at Bitcoin and I would look at it on the daily and the weekly. And if that market structure is bullish, I'm bullish across the board. If you go look at the last all-time high when price went all the way up to like 70K, we never made a lower low on the daily until the top was in. Mm -hmm. It's hard to believe. And when you're looking at it on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not looking at the daily chart. You're looking at the five-minute chart and you're seeing these huge green candles. But when you zoomed out, the market structure is much, even if we had these crazy big corrections, it never broke that kind of previous structure low. Mm -hmm. As soon as it did, I was out. Um, and then when it started making bullish markets, so for me, it was easy as that. Like I'm very much a technical trader i'm like if this is in an uptrend i'm buying and that's how i bought near the lows you know of previous cycles and even this cycle when we broke 
you know, we kind of went to 15 K we made a higher high on the weekly at like 20. I said, okay, I'm, I'm bullish until we lose that low. Then we make another higher high. I'm bullish until we lose that low. And if you try and be like, oh, this is a bull market. I have to think of it this way. I think you might miss out on certain opportunities trying to, you know, force yourself this a bull rather than just trade the chart that you see. Mm -hmm. But that what that's what works for me. Right. Um, I think for a lot of people, they want to buy early in the cycle and just hold until it gets crazy. Um, but I think you have to have some type of technical parameters to when are you taking profit? Because mm -hmm. there's so many people who, yeah, they bought Bitcoin at 3000. It went to 60K. Very few people held it from three to 60. Mm -hmm. But at what point are you selling? Do you have a monetary goal in mind? Do you have a technical level in mind? Are you waiting for market structure to change? Um, so I, I try and use the chart for almost everything. And then I do have certain monetary objectives. The thing with crypto now, it's so big, we are seeing diminishing returns on things like Bitcoin. Like mm -hmm. there's gonna be some new altcoin that goes up 10,000% and you're not gonna be in it and you're gonna be pissed. And some guy's gonna put in a thousand bucks and he's gonna make millions, you're gonna be pissed. Um, but for Bitcoin itself, like let's say in a really ideal scenario, it goes to 150,000, like that'd be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. That's a three X from here. I'm not saying that's not a crazy return, but unless you're dealing with large capital, three X is not retiring you. Mm -hmm. And that's what most people want. They say, how much do I gotta put in to never work again, basically? Yeah. Um, so if that's the mindset you're in in crypto, you got to be in the trenches and you got to be looking for those uh, new sectors. Like I think mm -hmm. AI is going to do very well in this next market cycle. And there's going to be a tons of coins around AI and things like that and machine learning that will do well in GameFi and things like that. You got to be in the trenches. You got to be finding those asymmetric opportunities. That's a whole different ball game than what I'm doing. These people are, you know, in discords and telegrams. Yeah. They're trying to get in stuff early. They're making, you know, they're spreading their bets out across different sectors. Um, I, I consider myself like a boomer. 80% of the crypto I hold is Bitcoin and Ethereum. Mm -hmm. The other 20% of it is, you know, I will spray into some kind of higher risk stuff. It's not exciting, but I've luckily enough, my portfolio is big enough where if Bitcoin went to 150K and Ethereum went to 10K, it's a ton of money. For someone with 20K, you know, that's not going to move the needle. You got to be looking for something else. So uh, it's fun right now. And I highly suggest if you're like a Forex trader, you're a futures trader, you trade price action, you trade indicators, I don't care. When crypto's moving how it's moving now, you're doing yourself a disservice by not at least looking at it. Mm -hmm. And I think you'd be pleasantly surprised to see how well the things that you've taught yourself in those other markets are transferable to crypto and to other markets in general. When crypto mm -hmm. was dying, I said, hey guys, if you know how to trade crypto, go draw those same lines on gold or your USD or the S&P, it, it works. Mm -hmm. Might not move as fast, but in you know FX, you're getting 100 to one leverage, you're getting 500 to one leverage, mm -hmm. you're getting 1,000 to one leverage. So a uh, half a percent move on Euro USD is a lot more than you think yeah. when you're dealing with those types of leverage numbers. So that information's portable. Definitely. No, I love that. And, you know, one thing that you, I don't know if you touched on it before, but in terms of uh, Bitcoin, for example, there's a lot of people who, uh, you know, in the space, I know there's a lot of uh, debating that goes on pretty much in the whole of the trading industry, but especially on the crypto side. And I know there's some people out there who go like, you know, Bitcoin eventually will just drop, you know, go back to zero. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, usually when people are saying that it's time to buy. <laughs> uh, and then usually when those same people are telling you it's going to go to 500k per it's time to sell mm -hmm. i do think that type of analysis does work really well with crypto like when my mom is texting me about her bitcoin investment yeah. i'm like okay like we're getting a little frothy um maybe it will right uh you could put your tinfoil hat on and you could say okay the powers that be that control the money and the central banks and blah 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 they don't want schmucks like me and my friends who bought crypto just early to buy you know fireworks on the silk road to have a bunch of money so maybe they're going to nuke it all to zero i would rather be optimistic um, and see that you know blockchain technology has a lot of uses outside of just being a form of transferring money around mm -hmm. um you know nft technology has a lot more uses than being pictures of monkeys mm -hmm. um you know it can be used for things like um deeds of ownership with art and provenance mm -hmm. and you know real estate and investments and things like that concert tickets and memorabilia like there's so many applications i think we'll see blockchain technology used for in the next decade mm -hmm. um, i think bitcoin 
my personal opinion, uh, will become something like a gold where it's just an asset that is traded. It has value. Mm -hmm. I think the volatility will decrease. Mm -hmm. It's already decreasing in Bitcoin, you know, and some of the larger ones specifically, especially as more regulation comes in as much as crypto guys are like, you know, screw the banks, screw the regulators and the SEC. You know, regulation is coming whether you want it to or not it's gonna come it has to come and there's it's not always a bad thing there are you know it's an it's annoying when you know you live in canada u.s and you're banned from using all these exchanges but it's yeah. also annoying when you know ftx steals all your money so there is a middle ground um but i don't think crypto is going anywhere will bitcoin go to zero one day i think highly unlikely and the the upside is potentially infinite. The downside is only to zero. So that's, to me, asymmetric bet on the upside. Um, but I highly, highly, not financial advice, but advise uh, people, if you're trading crypto, realize your gains. Mm -hmm. It's just like in prop, right? Where you can like make that money real, whether it's buying yourself a watch, taking some out, buying a house, taking some out, just having cash, so important. Um, I think that's one of the things that a lot of people wish they could go back to say, well, on paper, I was worth $5 million. It's yeah. like, well, what are you worth now? And was that money real? How about taxes, right? Are you are you setting enough side? Because guess what? If you made all that money this year, you didn't cash any out, and then price drops 50%, that tax bill is based on the old price, not the price now. Wow. Um, so you do have to realize that money as much as I'm you know, a crypto guy and I want crypto mm -hmm. to do well. I'm not paying my rent in Bitcoin. I'm paying my rent in dollars, mm -hmm. right? So I'm consistently extracting money from the market and then putting it into other things, whether it's new businesses, whether it's savings accounts, more traditional investments. I do think realizing money yeah. uh, is something a lot of crypto only guys um, are missing out on. And I, I highly not financially advise you <laughs> <laughs> to put some money in the bank and secure yourself. You make life changing money, yeah. change your life. Yeah, You know what I mean? Because I've been there already. I've seen the number go way up and all the way back down. It's not fun. Definitely. And one thing you have said to us in, in the group before, actually, is something to do with the altcoins. That some of these altcoins that you've seen crazy returns on and crazy all-time high prices, but then also, you know, since the bear market came in, completely dropped off the face of the earth too. You've said that, you know, the likelihood of them going back to all-time highs is quite slim. Can you just speak on that? So like people, a lot of people are obsessed with XRP. I remember XRP is the thing that got me into crypto in the first place. Sure. Um, and we've not seen, in the last bull market, we didn't see it beat the all-time high. So yeah. um, old coins as a whole, but then if you can touch on XRP there as well, I'm sure Absolutely. people would like to know. Shout out to the XRP army. I know you're out there still struggling. <laughs> so um, the thing is with most of these altcoins is they don't do anything, mm -hmm. right? Um, a lot of these altcoins benefit from a rising tide raises all ships. So when the market as a whole is going up, there's optimism, people are risk on, mm -hmm. they're willing to put their money into other stuff, things are pumping. And when the market is frothy like it is right now, you can launch a coin and you can say, I'm gonna do this, 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 and this. I'm gonna be the next Bitcoin, the next Ethereum. Like the first one was like LTC. Mm -hmm. It was like, we're the new, better Bitcoin, we're faster. Yeah right but it kind of you know had its market cycle and then it's kind of fallen into obscurity if you go look at the most popular altcoins in 2013 the bull run 2017 then 2021 you'll see a lot of the names in those top 10 altcoins change mm -hmm. bitcoin and ethereum seem to be the mainstays xrp is up there just because there's so much money in it at this point mm -hmm. But a lot of them fall to obscurity. They're never heard from again. And all, the majority of them never make new all-time highs. Outside of Bitcoin and Ethereum, a lot of these coins rarely, some of them do, right? Someone's going to say, well, what about this one? Some of them will. Most of them don't. Mm -hmm. For a few reasons. Primarily, um, when everything is going crazy, it, it was it's almost like Silicon Valley in the early 2000s where you could go in with an idea on a napkin and raise millions of dollars mm -hmm. without actually doing anything yet because there was just so much froth and money, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. That's what these altcoins are often like. They say, here's, they make all these promises. They release a white paper and a roadmap. They say, here's all the stuff we're gonna do that's mm -hmm. so awesome. And we're gonna partner with this company and the price goes up, right? And the people who created the token, they're making money when that price goes up. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they very rarely deliver on any of the stuff they said they were gonna do. So when the market crashes, I don't care if you accomplished everything you said you were gonna do. When Bitcoin crashes and the market goes down, everything's going down with it. And a lot of these altcoins can drop 80, 90, 95% off of their all-time highs. 
to get back to that all time high, you got to do like a hundred percent uh, or a thousand percent return. Like mm -hmm. the math becomes quite crazy. So when a new cycle happens, you had a coin in 2017 and now it's 2021. Okay, well, not only did you not deliver on all the stuff you told us you were going to, there's yeah. now a community of bag holders who own from way higher than prices now yeah. who are waiting to sell closer to break even. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see these new coins where there's no overhead supply, right? Mm -hmm. Go up like crazy and you see these other coins, they will go up. But you know, there's someone who owns XRP from a dollar who is every time it gets near there, they're trying to get out closer to break even. Yeah. So it's failed promises. It's the fact that there is these, these bag holders. There's people who held this coin down 90% and mm -hmm. they're like, it's gotta come back, right? It's that bag holder fallacy. It's sunk cost at that point. Like, is your money better off maybe just cutting what you have left and putting it in something else? Probably, but I'm never gonna convince an XRP person of that mm -hmm. um, as much as I can try. So XRP is an interesting one specifically. That's all coins kind of in general. Yeah. Some of them we'll see. Solana, for example, mm -hmm. it actually is a chain that people use. Mm -hmm. It does a lot of what Ethereum does better. It's more accessible. It's cheaper. It's faster. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it sees an all-time high again. But those coins that come out in a previous cycle go crazy and then do even better in a next cycle, those are a lot rarer. Yeah, It's much more common that if a coin goes to all-time high, it's never going to see that price again. There is a ton of coins that will never see the prices they saw in 2021 ever again. Doesn't mean you can't make money. Mm -hmm. I know people who trade XRP very well, right? They buy it at 30 cents, they sell it at 60 cents because yeah. it's just in a massive range. Sure. But from an investing perspective, you got to realize like this coin, I think it topped out over three bucks. Mm -hmm. Is it going to go there? Is it going to do a 10x? Maybe. There's so much of this token and so many people in it, the amount of money that would have to be pumped into it to get that 10X is insane versus some new coin. Um, there's also a lot of, um, I guess, so like XRP was sued. They were you know, fighting a case against the SEC. Mm -hmm. So there's some sort of regulatory implications. They won the case or they're winning the case. I don't really keep up with the XRP army these days. Um, so maybe that, all that kind of systematic overhead risk gets lifted and maybe it does do very well mm -hmm. but you have to like your your job as an investor because crypto yeah there's trading but a lot of it is investing mm -hmm. is where is you know the the alpha you know where am i going to get the best return on my money and i think if you just look at the chart of xrp there's a lot of coins that just look better that yeah. haven't been around for so long, they don't have all of these negative aspects to it, that in my opinion, you're probably better off putting your money into. Um, don't marry your bags, right? Like anyone who has XRP in their Twitter name or Link is another big one in their Twitter name, um, they're so tied to it and it's an emotional thing. You made money on, a lot of these guys, they made a ton of money mm -hmm. on that coin and it's impossible to let go. So instead of trying to make a ton of money on another coin, they're just like, well, this is the one that made me a million bucks. So like, it's gotta come back, mm -hmm. right? And it's that bag holders fallacy and they just can't quite get away from it. I mean, more power to you guys, XRP Army. I hope it goes to uh, $10 a coin and I hope you all make it super big. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm praying for you. But uh, sometimes you gotta know when you cut your losers. It's just like regular trading, right? Like, okay, cut this loser. It, there's also a, a mental tax Mm -hmm. to holding something you know that far down and the relief you will feel i'm telling you by cutting that bag and then maybe reallocating and guess what you can always buy it back too yeah it's not like if you sell it now you can't buy it back if things change but it's very hard to convince people who are that emotionally mm -hmm. attached that's something that i think is more unique to crypto than it is to fx is people like yeah. you don't love euro usd where you're like i'm never selling my euros right like mm -hmm. In crypto, like people will make their whole personality a coin, yeah. which is just hilarious. How, how important do you think it is to try and avoid the mindset of trying to catch the bottom? You know, because I feel like, especially if you're, you're rather than uh, crypto trading, you know, if you're investing, trying to catch the bottom is a probably a very dangerous mindset to have because I'm sure there were people, let's say with Bitcoin, um, who were like, it's going to go to sub 10K and it didn't get there. And then they completely, not only did they not buy then, but as it started to make bullish structure, they just avoid buying because they keep having the mentality of it's going lower. 
even now even yeah. though we are as high as we are now they still got that same mentality of no worries you know we're not going to see an all-time highs we're going sub 20k oh, you know? i love this question so um you don't know it's the bottom until it's the bottom <laughs> right? Mm. Just like you don't know it's the top until it's the top. Mm. And so I talked about it earlier, like when are you taking profit on something that's in price discovery? Mm. You don't know where the mania ends. So you have to have some rules Mm. to be like, okay, well, I'm up 10x on my investment. That's enough. Or at least that's enough to take some out of the game. Mm -hmm. The same goes for the bottom, right? So last cycle, um, I started buying Bitcoin at 6,000. It went down to three. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah, those 6,000 buys for a little while started looking real shitty mm-hmm. when we were at three, but I kind of told myself, I said, listen, I sold near 20 K. Um, it's down 80 to 85% from all time high. Mm-hmm. It's been, you know, two years of down and relative to previous market cycles, this is usually where things bottom out. Um, I just started buying. I said, every dollar I'm putting in here, I'm prepared to lose. And I'm more interested in catching the meat of the move than I am interested in trying to catch the absolute bottom, sell the absolute top. People who bought it at the absolute bottom, they didn't hold it to 60K, right? They bought it at three and then they sold it at six. So I kind of bought in a range and I did the same thing this time. I told people, I said, below 20K, I think Bitcoin's a good buy. Could it go to 10? Maybe. Um, And I'll buy more, right? And I'll Mm -hmm. leave some ammo, some dry powder, but I'm buying under 20. And then when it gets back above and starts creating that structure, I'm putting the rest in and I'm I'm kind of letting it go. Um, there's a guy, I think I've sent it to our group, like uh, he goes by Capo and he basically was convinced that, you know, we're going to 10K and we're at like 15K and he's like, we're almost there. And now we're at almost 50, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And you don't want to, it's like uh, you, you can't see the, the forest through the trees, right? Like you can't have this bias that you're married to. It's no different than FX. Like if you think we're going up and all the evidence suggests that we're going down, like you have to be able to lose the ego and be like, oh, I was wrong. Okay, let me pivot. Mm-hmm. And if you can't do that, you're not going to survive, whether that's crypto trading, life in general. You got to, it's strong opinions, but yeah. they got to be loosely held. Definitely. No, I love that. And we're just going to go into some like quick fire questions, if you will. And, sure. you know, as a, as a crypto trader, no doubt you probably have some interesting stories in terms of like big losses. Is there any sort of notable losses? I know you mentioned about FTX, um, but is there any notable losses that stand out to you that were really like, you know, I always remember that maybe oh. some major lessons off the back of them as oh, well. Oh gosh, I have a couple. So real quick, I'll, so FTX was insane, but that wasn't, I mean, it's my fault for having that much money on an exchange where technically it's not my money. Mm-hmm. It's counterparty risk there. It's like putting your money with a sketchy broker. You don't really know yeah. if they're going to honor your withdrawal, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that was awful. So I was long so many altcoins basically right into the top. So I'd had my best stretch of trading ever in um, March and April going into May of 2021, which effectively was the high on Bitcoin. Yeah. Usually what happens is Bitcoin tops and starts to distribute. Altcoins have this one last crazy hurrah mm-hmm. and then the whole market corrects. Yeah. And I knew that, but I was on such a heater and I'd made so much money over the last couple of months that you know I'm just like, okay, like a little bit more juice to squeeze out of this thing. Um, and I remember because it was Jake Paul fighting I, I want to say it was either Nate Robinson or like the first Tyron Woodley fight, but yeah. it was a Jake Paul fight. I'm in all these longs and it was the market environment where no matter what you bought, if you waited a day or two, you were in profit. Mm-hmm. Like it was easy mode. You, I wasn't using stops. Like I'm just like, everything's going up, press the green button, make money. And I remember having my girlfriend at the time over and I'm like, okay, like I'm well positioned. Everything's mega green. And um, we're gonna watch this Jake Paul fight. We're gonna have you know some drinks. It's gonna be a good time. And basically, that was like the top of the market. Mm-hmm. You can put the Jake Paul date on the chart. That's like the top. <laughs> and uh, I lost a crazy amount of money. Like obviously, I was still up over the last three months. Yeah. But basically, three months of like consistent growth, and I gave back like forty percent of what I had made over those three months. Like I was, so, I'm, I'm yelling at my girlfriend. She's like, "What's wrong? Like you don't understand. Like you know and I'm watching it and what happens in crypto is when you have these massive cascades down, yeah, your account can get liquidated, right? And so I'm watching and my liquidation price and the price of all these coins are just approaching, approaching, approaching. And I know, cause I've been doing this so long, I say, as soon as I close, we're gonna bounce, have like, you know, a dead cat bounce. Yeah. And I could have saved 20% of my money, 
but it's not going to happen until I close. Like that's just how it's Murphy's law. Yeah. So that one was was brutal. I closed like the pico bottom. Next day, everything was up fifty percent. You know, it's sickening, but it happens. Yeah. Uh, that one was gross. Another funny one is so Mount Gox was like one of the first exchanges back in two thousand thirteen that yeah. got hacked, and people are just now like in the next year or two, going to get their money back. So I had five Bitcoin back then. Wow. But at the time, that was 500 to $5,000. Like it wasn't a lot. Mm-hmm. And the bankruptcy claim, and it was all in Chinese. And so I brought it to a lawyer and he's like, it's going to cost me more to translate this <laughs> and fill it out for you than you're going to get back. So yeah. I never did it. Five Bitcoin now would be, you know, 200, 250,000. No, more than that. Like like 200 grand, yeah. 250 grand. So uh, that's another upsetting loss that I wish I wish I would have went through. But there's what about notable wins? Oh gosh, I mean the three months leading up to that massive <laughs> loss was the most money I've ever made. Um, so the bottom of the market in 2018. So we had the 2016 17 bull run. Went to like 20k. Mm-hmm. Then it went down to like 3k. I started buying. So I wrote an email to about 50 people. My parents, some my best friends, you know, some family members, like, you know, close people, my brothers. Yeah. And I, it's like, this is like a 5,000 word email basically saying, here's my thesis on like why I'm buying crypto now. So Bitcoin was like $4,000. Ethereum was like 80 bucks. I said, here's what I'm doing. Here's why I had the charts. I said, you know, I think we're here in the market cycle. I think the market's bottoming. I think the stock market is looking up. I, and I wrote like this massive thing down to like, here's exactly how you can buy. Here's how you can get a wallet to store your coins. Mm-hmm. Here's the coins that I'm buying. Everything. I sent that email. The first few responses were like not interested. Right. And then I would update it. Right. Bitcoin's now at 10K. Ethereum's now at, you know, a couple hundred bucks. I'm like, update more unsubscribed not interested the only two people that bought were my mom and my dad wow that's it and i ended up just buying for them because they're like listen we believe in you but i don't want to do it just buy for us basically um and they outperformed everyone like they did like a 15x on what they put in um but i had friends right like i'm like dude like just trust me like you know i'm not saying go all in but like i'm i'm really confident in this and they're like unsubscribe and so i stopped updating it and then bitcoin made I think it went finally got to like 40k yeah and i sent one final update i'm like this is now 10x on when i told you like yeah. six months ago and ethereum's like 25x this is the last of those emails and sure enough who are those same people texting me hit me up on instagram facebook hey man like it's now a good time to invest i'm like yeah i'll sell you mine because like i'm out now i already <laughs> i already caught the meat of the move man you want to come in and try and cash this top like by all means so mm-hmm. That's a story that's always funny. And I mean, I'm sure you can attest as being a successful guy. It's funny how it changes how people view you and how yeah. they interact with you. Yeah. Um, and and like I get it, people giving me advice where I'm like, but you didn't believe in me in the first place. Like, who are you to tell me? Yeah. Well, be careful about that crypto thing, man. I'm like, okay, well, uh, you know, enjoy going to work tomorrow, I guess. Like, what do you what do you mean? Like, be careful. It's just it's just funny. It changes their perception of you. And I think there's a lot of entitlement in this world when people see you succeed. Yeah. And it tells you a lot about who your friends are. Like, you know, there's people who you thought were your friends who are Mm -hmm. jealous or they're just like, Hey, can you teach me how to invest and trade? I'm like, I tried, you know what I mean? Like, why am I going to do that now? So, you know, that, that's, that's one that I always remember being Mm -hmm. funny. What's it like though? Like you said, in terms of friends, I know the crypto community is very active. You know, I feel like the FX community has started to grow on Twitter a lot more over the recent, say, like 12 to 18 months, especially as someone who started off, as you said, with like forums and a lack of education of being available like it is now, like so much now yeah. that's just available for free, like in all the different platforms. Um, and even then, back then, the, the platforms weren't even used as they are now. Um, so what's it like now, obviously, having such a big community in the crypto side? And I'm sure you probably connected and made friends. Oh, even like me sure. and you, like we only got to know each other through like getting into a Telegram group and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so what's it been like to obviously make all these connections now and, and these friendships um, just by using the social media space? It's so funny. It's something like my fiance will never understand or my family. I'm like, I have like so many of my friends are like online. Like mm-hmm. I have people who like I will invite to my wedding and I've met them in person once. But like we talk every day, yeah. You know what I mean. Um, so it's awesome. You know, I I used to go to conferences and I'll go to events and stuff. Mm-hmm. I have friends who put on crypto centric events and like I'm all about that. I think um, having community is so important. Trading is isolating, 
right? Like it's not like you have, you know, your guy sitting at the desk next to you that you're getting lo- like it's you're alone mm-hmm. a lot. Um, so I think having those communities and even though they're online, it's it's so important that human. I think COVID was very eye opening for people. It's like human interaction is so key. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and more than anything, obviously, I've made some great friends. It's been awesome. I've made amazing connections, whether it's you know, meeting people who are in cities that I'm traveling to and they're giving me restaurant recommendations. They're, you know, hooking me up with this thing. I'm, I went to Ibiza. I had a guy with like five followers or 50 followers DM me. He's like, dude, I'm the man in Ibiza. You've helped me so much. Like, I'm going to take care of you. Mm-hmm. And he's taking me to restaurants that I would never find on my own. He's yeah. getting me into the club backstage behind the, like crazy stuff all because I post on Twitter. So that part of it is amazing. I think the other side of it for your development is you're finding people who understand what you're going through. Mm -hmm. I cannot commiserate with my buddy who's a firefighter or, you know, a mortgage broker who like they have a, not that there's anything wrong with regular jobs, but it's really hard to tell someone who works nine to five, be like, man, I lost 15 K today. Yeah. They're going to be like, like, that's what I make in, you know, three months. What do you mean? And it's so having people that you can talk to about the journey, about the process, who don't think you're crazy, because it, it is kind of crazy what we do, mm-hmm. um, is, is so important um, to be able to commiserate with them, to be able to grind with them, share information. Like uh, I've learned so much from other traders, other people that have expedited my learning early on, especially. Uh, and people online are so giving. Mm-hmm. Like it used to be like a thing you had to pay for. Yeah. Right. Back in the day where it's like, you want to talk to like Tony Robbins and get some life advice from this business mogul. You got to pay for a dinner. Mm-hmm. You got to pay to go to a course or to like a, a retreat where now there are multimillionaires on Twitter, just giving out game for free. And if you are not absolutely trying to absorb that knowledge and take advantage of all that, you're doing yourself a disservice. Uh, whether it's trading or otherwise, like you can go online, you can find someone who will give you a complete, you know, lesson on, uh, guitar Mm -hmm. on YouTube for free. Mm -hmm. Whereas you used to have to go like the internet is so, so amazing for that. And it's changed my life. I I can't even explain. Definitely. No, I love that. And I think as, like you said, like when you go just the traveling aspect, I mean, you've connected with people online and uh, you might not even know you've had an impact on them, but then they reach out to you and they offer, you know, even if it's recommendations or even like taking you around and stuff, it's incredible. That alone is incredible. But the connections, the networking, even outside of just the crypto space, for example, or trading space, the the networking and other avenues, whether it, it could be an accountant, for example, it could be an advisor in something, it could be just someone who runs a particular type of business or chain of businesses. I think it's absolutely incredible. And I'm going to leave you with two final questions. One, uh, well, one's a less so a question, but one is uh, in the crypto space, you have crypto fight night, you know, and I've been pushing for and, and been mentioning a lot, like we should have an FX fight night. But like, what is it about the crypto fight night? Like, I know you've actually commentated, though. No? Yeah. So um, shout out to my boy Rookie um, and Mo and Raul who are putting that on. Um, this was our third year doing it. I unfortunately wasn't able to make it out this year just with travel stuff. Dubai's far. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would love for them to do it in Vegas one year. That would be awesome. Mm-hmm. Um I think we took a little bit of inspiration from, you know, the YouTuber kind of creators fighting each other. Um, I think it's great for two things. Um, one, you know, let's Twitter fingers become, you know, <laughs> real life punch in. I think that's like such an awesome, fun way because it's a safe, controlled environment. Yeah. And uh, like, especially in year one, like we had people who like, there was some legitimate beef between some of these guys online yeah. and then the mutual respect afterwards because you went in there and like you either gave out some hits you took some hits like i have insane respect for anyone who's willing to step in the ring i don't care if you're not pro you can get hurt in there yeah right you can get hurt in there um so massive amounts of respect for that um i think it was a fun way to again bring the community together make it real right Mm -hmm. because it's so easy when you're on twitter and these things like it's faceless right like yeah i show my face you show my face but it's still very easy to say something rude to someone, yeah. you know, when you're not like this, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, uh, Mike Tyson has a quote, right? Like everyone, you know, is real tough until there's like, there's, I can't remember the exact quote, but there's until a risk. punched in the mouth. Yeah, yeah, you get punched in the mouth, you have a plan and the internet has taught people to, you know, be tough online who might not be in person. Yeah. So I think there's that element of it as well. 
Um, and then I just think it's kind of great kind of, you know, promotion and, and marketing for space. And it's just fun. Like they mm-hmm. did such a good job. It was such How a great How do they event. get people to agree to do it? Cause I feel like that's the hard bit in the FX side. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, that was interesting. I mean, we did, uh, a lot of like reaching out to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and some people came in, you know, came up to us. I think, you know, there's weight classes you have to be aware of and skill level. Obviously you don't want someone who's never boxed before boxing someone who, uh, but you need a few people. The first year, it really was a few guys who just stepped up and were like, I'm willing to go in there. Mm-hmm. I've never boxed before. I'm going to take six months and, you know, not drink, eat clean, work out every single day and do this. And I, I would love to see it with FX. I, I'd be happy to come there and commentate it with you. Definitely. I think it's so fun. Um, I thought about doing it myself. I'm, I'm a bit of a bigger dude. And the first year, there was not really anyone kind of in my weight class. Yeah. Um, cause you know, like some of the guys is like, you know, this guy's five, six, 140 or <laughs> the other guy was so big and I would have to gain weight. Um, but I'm also a little older than some of these crypto guys. Like I'm 33 now. Um, I've been punched in the head in real life enough times to know that it's not very <laughs> fun. Um, and at least right now on the crypto side, like these guys are paying for all their own training and stuff, right? Yeah. So yeah, they've got some sponsorships that mitigate some of the costs, but really you're like, okay, hey, I'm six months, no drinking. I'm going to train. I'm getting a membership. Like. That's also a, you know, not everyone has the ability to take that level of commitment because yeah. it's crazy. These guys took it really seriously. I thought it was so fun. I'd love to see it happen in FX. And if you guys need help with the planning of it, venues mm-hmm. and stuff, we're, we're super plugged in in Dubai for that. Definitely. Hey, I'm going to hit you up yeah. for sure. And the final one I'm going to say is literally, you know, 30, 30 to 60 seconds down this camera here. You know, your best advice to traders out there, whether crypto, Forex, whatever it may be, you know, most traders find themselves in that boom and bust cycle, you know, up and down, not quite losing, not quite winning. What would be your best advice to them to change that and get to that profitability? Uh, be process oriented. Do not focus on the end goal. Um, I think if you are going to write yourself some sort of end monetary goal, you need to break it down into steps that are manageable, that are bite sized, because otherwise you will feel like you're not progressing. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes traders make is they don't know how to recognize their own progression and their own success. And for a lot of reasons, maybe the goal setting is too big, or maybe they're not process oriented so they can actually see that they are making improvements and they actually know where they're deficient as well. If you can't tell what you're improving on, what you're lacking on, it's going to be very hard to track your process and get to be where you know you want. So as corny as it is, it's about the journey right? It's not so much the destination, you're going to get there, right? But you don't get there without all the steps in between. Uh, And I think you're going to massively, massively uh, expedite your uh, journey to profitability. If you break things down into a process that you can follow literally daily, that becomes weekly, that becomes monthly, that becomes yearly. I think you'll be very surprised when you go and look back at what you started the year at and where you're at the end of the year. And you can say, Oh, wow, I actually am you know, improving, um, I'm making those improvements and get off of social media, uh, at least initially, or if you're on it, take it with a grain of salt, because what you see on there is mostly, uh, not real life, not realistic. Love that. Thank you. Well, it's been an absolutely incredible conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. And I think there's so much to take away from it. And uh, hopefully yeah, we'll do this again soon. And if not, we'll see each other at uh, FX fight night sometime. Bro, I would love to. It'd be so fun. <laughs> Definitely. Well, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Drop a comment below with your biggest takeaway, you know, your biggest lesson. You know, the links to Trader Main, aka Dylan, will be below. So make sure you check those out as well. And until next time, everyone, take care.